Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Isaacson uh, from Spectrum Gaming Capital. Uh, I, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Ne this, this panel, we're going to be talking about uh, technology. And I think the, the overarching theme of this is should digital gaming operators buy their own technology, build their own technology, or uh, partner with a third party and, so to speak, rent technology? Um, I think what is very complicated about when people talk about technology, it's so important and it's uh, it's so critical to your business. But I don't think uh, as a customer, as a sports better myself, I really understand truly what's behind, uh, what, what's, what's kind of under the hood of all these uh, digital gaming companies and why technology is so important. So what we're going to try to do, we have experts on our, on our panel here, and I know I'm not supposed to introduce them, they're going to introduce themselves and kind of get right into it, but is to parse kind of uh, why technology is so important, what are some of the complications and issues with technology, um, and, and you know, kind of where technology is going in the digital gaming and sports betting uh, uh, universe. Um, and just to give you, you know, some examples of technological strategies or, or, or things that the companies are employing, uh, DraftKings buying SB Tech, right, is an example of, a, of, a, of an operator that bought their own technology, another deal, uh, Boyd recently buying Pala Interactive. Uh, to acquire their iGaming technology. Uh, we have uh, the CEO of, Neo, of uh, Aspire Global, uh, which Neo Games bought Aspire Global to augment their technology. Uh, and then, you know, another strategy is Rush Street Interactive, which rents their technology from uh, our friends at Canby. So all different strategies. Uh, and, you know, this, this particular panel, we have um, a, a sports betting investor and former operator. We have an iGaming consultant to kind of represent uh, the, the investor and consultant. Uh, and then we have two operators uh, in sports betting and iGaming. So you're really going to get to hear from all voices. Um, Itzik, I want to start with you as, a, as our iGaming consultant. Can you describe uh, the, the importance of technology for iGaming? Uh, you know, go into kind of you know, you worked with uh, Golden Nugget Online Gaming, which is the leading operator. They actually switched technologies uh, a year into their business. So can you kind of talk about your experience working with them and, and, and you know, what are the, uh, the, the, the most important parts of technology and also give us some more stories and the headaches of technology? Yeah, so, so thank you. Uh, and, and really, this is a good example where a lot of the time when we, we're talking about investments and all kind of M&As, and uh, those are usually done by people that don't really handle the operation. And a lot of the time, they're also being done way before we even know what the regulations are going to be. So there's, uh, we, we look at technology. Uh, there's a lot of great technology out there, but I look at it almost like a matchmaking process. Uh, you need to fit the right technology, the right company with the right uh, operators. And, you know, Golden Nugget was a good example of... of uh, you know, we kind of were handed over the solution by some people that signed the deal four years before that. Then we said, okay, well, we're here to operate. What do we work with? And it turns out it was good for poker in Europe, but not really for what we need in the U.S. Then we go through the process of essentially uh, adjusting the technology. It was very intense, very labor intensive. And then some of those proper providers, in that case, uh, it was uh, uh, Bali at the time, said, okay, well, we're not in that business anymore. So they pulled out, and then you need to find yourself a new partner. So this is where you actually have the right opportunity to, to go and select, really, what you need, what will be the right fit for you. In this case, the selection was, okay, we're going to go, we're going to prove that we can do it with a partner. Uh, in, it was NYX. Uh, it worked out well. It still is working well for them. And I think this is a good example of how people bring a lot of the know-how from Europe they match it to what is needed in this market, and they can run with it. Uh, it's a good combination of good people skill, good knowledge of gaming, very, very uh, realistic approach towards the, the market. Uh, I think at the time we were the only one that actually had good uh, you know, forecasts into what the market will be, and we didn't have to like, scale back or anything, and then you can go from there. But I look at it really, the, for me, if you decide to go and partner with a platform provider, it's a very, very uh, specific process of selecting not just the technology, but also the, the type of partner that you're going to be working with, the type of services, the SLAs. There's a lot of things that are going into this. 
And just one comment, you, you mentioned the, you, you know, learning from Europe and applying best practices from there to the U.S. Is there, uh, is there any relevance uh, or di key differences between the two markets and, and, and kind of what technology, uh, how it needs to adapt uh, in the U.S. market versus the, you know, kind of uh, technology that's, that exists and is successful in Europe? So, so we need to remember that a lot of the technology in Europe, uh, there's a lot of newer technology. And then there's a lot of technology that started pre-regulation. So I, I'm not saying that it's good or bad. There's a lot of companies that were very, very successful in adapting uh, into the more regulated markets. But I just want to say, you know, we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. I mean, we can learn from what worked there. We can see how people approach uh, the, the markets in Europe. And the markets in Europe are also in that process of we're in the process of you know, doing a country by country, sometimes even states within countries, with their own regulations, with their own rules, very much like what we're seeing here in the US. So there's a lot of those similarities. And if your partners, your technology provider understands that, can cope with that, can provide you the right services this way, then you probably be able to handle the different requirements in the markets here uh, in the US. Okay. Benji, I want to go to you now. Um, Benji, you come at this, uh, you know, from a sports betting perspective, both as, as an operator and now as an investor. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the importance of technology in sports betting? Uh, and what are the most important aspects? I, I think when I read all these, um, I, I read a lot of trade uh, articles and uh, Flutter or FanDuel is always touted as the, the, the best app. So can you kind of talk to why that is and maybe just uh, uh, why why it's so relevant for sports betting. So I don't, I don't want to say who the best app is. I guess beauty's, I in, the, it, not beauty's in the eye of the beholder, I guess, <laughs> but uh, certainly they have a, a very good one. But look, I do approach it from the sports betting perspective. And, you know, when you say what's important within technology, of course the answer is everything. But I think some of the USPs, when you look at the sports book side of it is, you know, you, you, you got to look in terms of managing the player and the risk management and especially to the extent that you want to move away from having significant betting limits that restrict what people can bet on given sporting events and given in-play occurrences within a sporting event the better job that you can do of profiling the players understanding who they are understanding who your sharper betters are and understanding the risk profile within each individual player and for your operation as a whole and being able to incorporate that into your risk management strategy, that becomes more of a bookmaking uh, expertise uh, situation and being able to utilize advanced next generation technology to assist with that you know, becomes interesting. And look, I, I do invest in advice to different companies and there's some new technology coming, which is interesting. I have no involvement, but there's a company uh, called Jindo coming out that, you know, they integrate really kind of advanced metrics as it pertains to the risk management and, and the player management profile that can become part of a platform experience. So I don't think it's necessarily a question of having a platform that's one size fits all and all encompassing and needs to adjust to the specifics of a given operator. Got it. Uh, now, going to, to our, our operators here on this panel, uh, we'll start with you, uh, um, Sachi. Uh, Aspire was acquired by Neo Games. Neo Games is an eye lottery company. Aspire is more of, a, of an eye gaming company. Uh, can you talk about uh, the acquisition, why they did it, uh, and the integration of the two companies? Obviously, it's, it's two different businesses, but also two very similar businesses. What are some of the integrating integration challenges uh, and, 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 uh, and positives about this transaction? So uh, No Games is operating in the eye lottery, as you said, and they are serving a palm to national lotteries. In many countries around the world, National lotteries are serving not only scratch cards and lottery games and draw-based games, but starting to offer also sport betting and casino games and esport and bingo. So if you say Neo Games offering a national lottery only PAM, so tomorrow they can offer PAM, casino games, sport, esport, bingo, and managed services. And all of those are being owned by Aspire. So instead of them taking X percent of the wallet of the national lottery, they can now take X times four. So this is the advantage that they have. Currently, 
the majority of the national lotteries outside of the US are able to uh, serve more than just lottery games. But probably in the future also national lotteries in the US will enter as well. So this is their uh, rationale to acquire Aspire. Got it. And then Robison, we, we'll go to you. Uh, Robison, you work for, for, you're the head of Bally's Interactive. And you know, for, for those of you that don't know, uh, Bally, the, the, the public company, has made a lot of acquisitions. They, they, they bought Gamesys, which is a B2C digital gaming company based in Europe. Uh, they obviously have land-based casinos. Uh, they bought B2B technology by buying Bet.Works for sports betting. They also bought a daily fantasy sports company called Monkey Knife Fight. So they, and, and other acquisitions as well that I'm not mentioning here because we're supposed to be focusing on technology. Robison here is, is focused on the integration of these different businesses. They're all digital businesses uh, and obviously there's a there's an element of the digital feeding the land-based business as well so maybe you can talk about uh, your your journey uh, what are the goals and and you know kind of where this is all going for a, a massive company like Bally's well we were bought Gamesys was bought I got taken over from Gamesys brought into Bally's because really we're a great data company right and for us it's all about understanding the player some people have talked about that and uh, making sure that you have a clear strategy for a market. It's very important to make sure that you do these things market specific, as you described, um, because there are some core truths which carry through and are consistent, right? You need to have a great PAM. Sometimes people believe every PAM is equal, right? And actually the PAM needs to be stable, robust, because ultimately we have to be as trusted as a bank so you can have a good time, right? No one can ever have fun if they don't feel safe. Right, so we have looked at our integration and said, let's take the most robust parts of the PAM. So great platform. That's going to be the GameSys platform as the PAM and taken the sports betting engine from Betworks and focused on integrating that. Uh, so taking the best of what we have and being really honest about that, right? Like, let's be clear. No one can be great at everything. So you have to pick off each ideal element and actually make sure that aligns to your strategy for us. Our focus is all about the data piece um, because the data piece allows you to interact with players at an individual level and target at an individual level. And that will give you huge efficiencies. I look at some of the advertising pictures, which are going around with DraftKings and others who do huge amounts of marketing spend. And I believe that you can be way more effective and way more efficient by targeting more precisely. That comes down to your data and your tracking. So our integration challenges have really been about us being honest and saying, this is good, this is bad, and deleting the bad bits and taking the best that we have. If you're not honest, you end up with, call it a one-stop shop. You end up with the Swiss Army knife type platform, which is basically the worst of everything, right? It's not the best knife, not the best anything. So actually, we have spent all of our time going through those steps and being clear about what needs to be done first. But data for us is everything. That isn't just, you know, build a data platform. It's actually having deep understanding of what it means. So when I say I look at a market, a lot of market behaviors differ due to cultures, right? So in a place like Asia, you tend to see far more table game play. Therefore, someone's winning experience has a far lower standard deviation because you tend to only get 2x wins, not the 1,000x wins. Now you need to understand that, analyze that, and understand what the players are feeling so you can retain the best players. And uh, make sure you're efficient and very effective. There's a lot of wasted money out there. Um, it's been challenging because there are so many companies, um, but we're picking off the important bits first. Um, and then we'll focus on all of our other assets, which are really about the funnel. We want to acquire cheaply. Um, we don't want to spend a fortune on marketing, um, so it's a bad culture. You know, you want to make, you want to run a business in the end. So it sounds like what you're saying, though, is 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 the the customer data is your your most important thing, and you're going to focus on that and kind of layer in the technologies, whether you have to buy them uh, or build them or or uh, contract with a third party. You're going to layer in those other features around the kind of the the meat and potatoes yeah. of your of your whole operation. Yeah, in general, I don't like to rent because that means you share everything with your com competition, right? So I don't tend to rent anything. That obviously has knock-on effects because of speed, 
right, that you have to build, but actually we go about and buy stuff, right? So you can buy things and move faster. So you can have the benefit of renting by buying, but actually making sure you don't give it to your competitors. Got it. Okay, I want to uh, switch topics a little bit, you know, more general and kind of open it up to all of you to comment. Um, you know, all of these these companies, it's, it's there's been a lot of uh, ink uh, spilled about how none of the sports betting companies are making any money, uh, and obviously you're seeing that in the in the public markets. Um, you know, we we at Spectrum Gaming Capital view sports betting as something that's going to evolve from you know kind of. The market has just started about four years ago. Um, there's the, this onboarding and education of the entire U.S. to start betting on sports, and then I, I believe I think that it could become more of an iGaming product, and you'll see the gamification of sports betting in this country. Um, and to me, that means uh, more personalization of, of the customers. Uh, you know, getting to know their their betting habits, uh, where they live. You know, kind of offering them different bets in game, and and kind of the aug the aug augmenting of in-game betting. So I want to talk about how technology needs to evolve or where it is today uh, in order to increase the, the, you know, increase personalization and, and, you know, improve the profitability of sports betting so that it becomes more like iGaming. You know, maybe you guys can, each of you can uh, comment on that. I'll start by saying that uh, if you go into a sports betting knowing that in the future it's going to turn into iGaming, but you don't have already an iGaming solution, you're going to be in trouble. That, that's the reality. There are a lot of sports betting platforms that, for some reason, cannot know or do not know how to, how to handle iGaming. And for me, that's, that's an involvement that's going to happen. Again, in Europe, in the rest of the world, we look at it as one umbrella. It's online gaming. Within that, we have verticals. And there's expertise for sports betting and for casino and other verticals. But but there's a lot of those core capabilities. And for somewhere in the US, we, we, we tend to see that platforms and solutions are labeled for just sports betting, and then for some reason cannot do iGaming. So think about it as it's gonna come. It's gonna take some time, but iGaming is gonna come. And, and for me, this is the, the key to have those capabilities to be able to, to provide a more of a, of a holistic package of, uh, of offering, and it could then evolve. You want to have that flexibility to evolve into additional verticals. For me, and a vertical is, a vertical is something that you're going to plug in. It, can, it may not be your primary offering, but you know, everybody knows that sports betting without casino cannot make as much money. So you want to think about that. You want to think about the other things that are going to come in. Uh, you want to think about uh, additional uh, CRM and other tools that will further augment everything, but will cover your entire uh, portfolio of verticals and not just the one. That, that for me, is the key. Robinson? Uh, I agree. Uh, I, I am iCasino through and through. That's our entire heritage, and we believe that's where you'll make money. Uh, the U.S. has one fundamental problem, which there just isn't that much sport, right? There isn't actually that much sport to bet on. Uh, so audience will be, audiences will be way more transient. And our focus has very much been on saying, how can you be great in iCasino? We're treating sports as the funnel. So all of our plans will be about where's iCasino Whoops, coming first. Pop that back. You should go to someone else. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Do you hear me? Yeah. We hear you. If I'm taking you to the original question of proprietary versus non-proprietary, what do we need from an operator? He needs to focus on operation and marketing. Mm -hmm. And of course, through the operation, he needs to differentiate himself. If he will build from scratch everything, if it's related to iGaming or to sport, it will take him very long time in order to have those experiences, knowledge, that other companies already built with the history and experience in Europe, around the world, all the scars that companies have on their back. So if they want to differentiate, there are a lot of platforms that can allow them to differentiate. But if you will add to an operator another layer of technology, you are adding another layer of focus. Not everyone can handle it. So of course, you know, the obvious thing for me to say is that you need to take not proprietary, you need to take a supplier. But it's not correct 100%.
Because if you are big enough, you need probably to have your own. If you are focusing on one market, two markets, you probably need to have your own. You need to have your own. But today, the roadmap that each of any of us is having throughout the year, more than 50%, if you are operating in more than three, four regulated markets, more than 50% of your roadmap is to comply with all the updates of the regulation, with the mm -hmm. tones of changes. Which is always changing. All the time changing. Yeah. Now, if you are an operator and you are focusing now on that, you are not in the business. So whether it's gaming or sport, you need to focus on what you are born to do. And this is uh, to be an operator. So I agree with everyone that gaming is the money. But you need to have also the scars of how to do it well. It's not enough to have a platform that can generate transactions. Where is the CRM? You know, a lot in the US are not familiar with fraud management. Tons of money is being leaked out from the business. Tons. They don't see it. They don't even know how to handle it, how to stop it. So I think just uh, being with a big ego, taking you to have your own, and there is an, enough room to, to learn from others that have those cars. So, so it's not definite. It's not only suppliers, and it's not only uh, proprietary. Okay. Benji, before we go to you, Robison, you, mentioned, you said something that was a little bit provocative that I just wanted to follow up on. You said, we don't have an, a lot of uh, product here in terms of sports betting product compared to Europe. Can you just expound on that statement? Well, the key sort of product category for sports betting in Europe is soccer, right? Right. So actually, in any, any one day, there will be, call it, over, well, couple of hundred at least fixtures which people can be betting on and there's almost always something in play which you can actively bet on. If you go to most sports books in the US, it, there's very little, right? You have because to wait till actually nighttime. it's a cultural thing. Yeah. It's a cultural thing, right? I constantly say the best thing that could ever happen to sports betting in the US is if the USA win the World Cup, the soccer World Cup, <laughs> right? That might help, but there isn't enough sport. If there aren't enough touch points with anything, you don't get into habits. You don't retain as well. There's more drop-off points, right. right? You need everything to be constant cycles. So actually, the, the fact that sport does stop, NFL does stop, there's another time each season to try and acquire those customers. So actually, you need to focus on um, extending people into other product sets, which you can actually have. No, there's no good reason for anyone to come back to a casino site, right? The tables are there, they're always open. Mm -hmm. So if you can retain to that, that's quite impressive, right? So actually you understand the player, you know when they need to feel that sort of taste of the thrill, right? That's when you have to pick it. And that's exactly when you have to have precise marketing to attract the customer at the right time. And yes, there, many of the apps will be relatively similar, but actually you can't control the experience anyone has. It's very random, right? So. If you can detect when people might have a bad experience, do it early enough, people, how they're feeling, all of that kind of player detection and AI and algorithms, which take forever to build, you know, and you got it wrong many times over the years. But that type of knowledge and that type of data integration is where you'll see all the value. The winners will be the people who have had the scars and who accept that some things should be great and other things don't matter that much. I want to add one, one point. Sure. You hear from operators saying, why should I throw away 10-15% of the NGR as expenses to a third-party supplier? But it's 10-15% that even if you will have it yourself, you will need to have the manpower to manage it. So it's those 10%. You will have it. So now we are talking about 3 to 5%. This is the experience. If you will not have the experience in how to do it and all the scars on your back, so it, those 5% that you will need to pay additionally, if you will not pay it, probably can be much more expensive to your business. So it's not only to look at the PNL, ah, I'm throwing away 10, 15%. It's not like this. 
And this is a journey that the companies need to do to understand what's better for them and not to think that I'm paying someone else. It's okay sometimes. Yeah. So I'm going to agree with what a lot of you are saying, and I'll disagree with some of it as well. So sports betting as a funnel for iGaming, sure, I agree with that. But Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was the U.S. market, right? So the fact that we don't have enough of a slot machine into, built into the U.S. sports, we're in early days here. There's going to be a lot more coming in terms of minor league baseball, in terms of the amplification of college sports, which, as you know, there's been some announcements recently regarding their data rights and the provision of it to the, to the betting companies. We're in year three or year four or whatever it may be of the next hundred years, and Europe's had a 70-year head start. So I think we've got to give it a little bit of breathing room. And if we go look at a bit of a history lesson, the history doesn't go back that far. It goes back to 2018. And you hang a shingle, and all of a sudden, we're going live in New Jersey with who knows how many states that have been following half the country in a, in a period of three years. And, and the goal of the operators wasn't to have, from day one, the world's greatest iGaming slash sportsbook platform. iGaming isn't even legal in the majority of the U.S., and sportsbook wasn't then either. They had to work with what they had to work with. So day one, you're getting, you're getting live, and you don't own a platform. So from day one, what do you got to do? You're either going Canby, or you're going SB Tech, or, or back in our day, Quincy, we were going Psy Games, which is, I guess, the artist formerly known as Psy Games. <laughs> And uh, you got to get live, and you got to get live in New Jersey for, for June 5th, and then you got to get live in Denver a month later. So it was a race against the clock to get live in as many states as you can, and it still is, primarily. And then within that, to your point, David, you know, we want to start bringing in how do you differentiate your sports book and make it different from, from the candy menu that everyone has, right? And, and the answer there becomes for some operators, as they mature and as they get big enough in scale, or as they come into the market the way the way a Bally's did, is, is maybe you look at your own technology, but that can happen overnight. So all of this is a process, and I think it's all going to get to where you're saying it's going to go, but we can't fault people for being where they are today. I'll stop there. Rant over. Uh, we have five minutes left. I, I'm, I'm not getting any questions here. I just want to make sure there's no questions in the crowd. Oh, we have... Who do you ask it? Not you. <laughs> if I could just reframe the question, I think what you're asking is, you know, you, you, the, the concept of your, you, you, you have, you're a B2C, you're trying to focus on your business, on your customers, and then you have this technology and you're thinking maybe I should buy my own technology, but then you kind of lose focus because, again, your core business is the B2C. That's how you make your money. Why don't you get the best technology provider to provide you the technology versus buying it yourself or building it yourself? That, that's kind of the question. And Robison, do you want to take that one since you're yeah, a B2C? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. It's kind of the argument of, is it important to be first, right? So actually, I would argue that a lot of new innovations come out. Some win, some lose. And actually, there's a learning curve that people go through. The players go through that. And actually, if we're thinking that those players are migrating for this new feature, this new function, these players will migrate again. Very transient. It does take significant investment and actually can only have scale, right, to be able to own enough. You have, it will cost a lot. Maintenance is always forgotten about, right? It's exactly what you were describing earlier, that people underestimate the, the battle scars and actually the maintenance overhead. Fortunately, as our company, we have sufficient scale and sufficient opportunity to deploy the same asset in many, many jurisdictions. You can't do it for most operators without that scale. So I agree. It depends on the tool, depends on your business, depends on how much you can afford, and actually really depends on your strategy. If I, if I may add, again, if you're posing that question and you're not the size of, or have the, the wallets of, of, of Bali's, then I would say don't look into owning it right now. Uh, there's a lot of things that come into play the war in Ukraine right now makes it almost impossible to get developers because the developers are fighting right now and everybody else is getting triple the salaries and you cannot retain them like in order market. So there's a lot of those challenges. I would say find the right B2B provider that is a good partner. And a good partner means not that they will launch with you but then move on to 
deal with the next one and your window of working with them is closed until the next cycle, whatever, it's six months, nine months from now. But rather someone, and don't be afraid if they're smaller, you know, the big names doesn't per se, don't mean per se mean that, that they're going to get more quality. There's some very good smaller ones that can actually work extra hard to uh, service your needs because for them it's, it's more strategic than anything else. I want to just get in one last question. We have a minute and a half left. How should, and anyone can take this, how should investors evaluate and think about technology uh, when they're investing in a company? There's, there's various public companies like Cambi and GAN. What should they be thinking about when they evaluate these companies? Someone please take the, take the question. <laughs> I, I would look at it for me from a different perspective is that if I'm investing more in some of the B2B picks and shovel companies, you got to think of it in terms of what is the integration process? And I think that when you're looking at B2C operators that own their own technology, that integration can sometimes be a little bit easier, I would say respectfully to the B2B guys, simply because the operator itself, if they want a particular product, will, will focus more on that integration, whereas a third-party provider is listening to what the market asked for and what the specific operators asked for. I'll say that if you ever see as an investor somebody that says, I'm going to do both B2C and I'll then expand it to B2B, that's a red flag for me. I personally don't believe in that. I think you build a B2B organization with a service mindset or you build a B2C and you build the tools that you need, just like Rob said, you, you, whatever, whatever you need for yourself. But I don't believe in mixing them. I don't think that it makes sense. It could maybe, you mean, I'm generalizing here, but I, as, a, as an investment strategy, I, I wouldn't look at it this I way. I think that's a great answer. Strong point of view, which we like. Let's give a round of applause to our uh, panelists. Thank, Thank you. you.